know, for example, whoops. Uh, we know because research at uh, University of Pennsylvania and Cornell has found that basketball referees tend to give fouls to players of the opposite race more than players of, the, of their same race. And this is true for both white referees and for African-American referees. It's different degrees, but nonetheless still the same. We know that people make determinations of people's credibility based on accent. The researchers at Tel Aviv University at the University of Chicago found that we tend to believe people more if they have an accent that's more similar to us and less if they have an accent that's more different. With one exception, anybody want to guess what it is? French. British. British, yeah. We, we tend to think people with British accents are smarter. Now, we know that bias is a function, a natural function of the human brain, and it happens for a very clear reason. What function does bias serve? Anybody? Why do we have bias? Yeah, it keeps us safe, exactly right. It's, it's a human danger detector. We have to quickly determine whether this person is somebody we want to go towards or away from. It triggers fight, flight, or freeze in us. And, and bias is as natural to human beings as breathing. The challenge is when we demonize it, when we start to recognize bias as, a, as something that if we have, we're bad people, it actually puts us into hiding more. It causes us to not look at our bias as much, but actually deflect from, find reasons for our belief systems. Now, this is challenging as somebody who's worked in the diversity space for about 30 years. This is really challenging because for so long, the diversity space has lived inside of this sort of good person, bad person paradigm, if you will. And you know, we're sort of looking for the bad one and trying to fix them. And this is what a lot of diversity training has been, is find them and fix them training which is why a lot of times people come into diversity training like this. And even the discourse that we have reinforces that in lots of ways, you know, that, there's, that we advocate rather than trying to build something together. It's inherently problematic. And then we build biases into our institutions as well. So what do we call bias, for example, when you agree to write them down, when we all agree to them and even write them down? Qualifications. Yeah, qualifications. That's all qualifications are. Qualifications are simply biases that we've all agreed to and written down. Now, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. They can be very helpful sometimes. If you're evaluating hundreds and hundreds of resumes, it's valuable to have qualifications so that you can sort those resumes quickly. But it's not necessarily particularly helpful in terms of choosing the best person. And it, in, and it intentionally and problematically can sometimes exclude people who are, we might call the creative eccentrics the people who are outside of the norm of what we do. Now, we know that all human beings have built within us through our life experience uh, we might call an internal book of rules. You know, it happens all the time. We've got, we pick up throughout our life certain ways that we're supposed to be. And it's consistent with the things that we've been taught throughout our whole life, you know, various different kinds of things that we've learned are the right way to be or the wrong way to be. So we have literally thousands of rules in our internal rule book. They're unquestioned for the most part. They're not rules that we even see as rules. We just see them as the way things are. And that rule structure creates in our mind what we call schema. You know, schema, whoops. schema are frameworks for looking at the world that I know you work with in different ways that shape the things that we see and the things that we don't. So for example, look at this picture for a moment. And tell me if you can see any discernible image in this picture. What do you see? A bunny rabbit. A bunny rabbit. OK, anybody else? An aerial shot? OK, anybody else? A Google map? Huh? Yeah. A, bird. a bird? Let me make it easier for you. I'm going to superimpose a picture over now so you can see the actual image. Now what do you see? Cow. Does everybody see the cow? Anybody who doesn't see it yet? We could always do a remedial session, but let me point it out to you. So here are the two ears, the two eyes, and the nose, and this is the forehead. OK, everybody sees the cow now. Now I'm going to remove the superimposed picture. And tell me now if you can avoid seeing the cow. <laughs> right? Something that wasn't there a minute ago, invisible a minute ago, is now impenetrably in our line of vision. This is the way schema works. In this case, I've actually consciously shifted the schema to one in which you can now see something that wasn't there before. Now, we all know this happens. We know that it happens from the standpoint of our jobs. Everybody here has certain schema in your job that have you see things that other people don't see. <laughs> There are people who um, shine shoes, for example, who when somebody walks by are not looking at the people, they're looking at the shoes. You or I would see the people walking by, they would see the shoes. This is the nature of the way schema works. It shapes what we see and what we don't. And if this can be true for something as silly as a picture or as 
seemingly superficial to us as a particular job that we happen to be in at the moment, how can it not be true for us based on these identities we live our whole lives in? Our gender, our race, our sexual orientation, you know, our age, the generation we come from, all of these things are fundamentally affecting the schema, affecting the things that we see and the things that we don't. And this is why sometimes we're in circumstances where one person or a group of people see certain things <coughs> that other people just don't notice. So schema leads to the formation of background. I mean background in the sense that, um, that I uh, shape the world by my experience, that I actually see the world through a filter that is governed by the background experience that I've had. It's like a lens through which we filter the world. And background creates a phenomenon of, uh, of a coloration of our world, if you will. It's like a contact lens that gets put on our, over our eyes before we even realize that it's there. And the world actually looks blue to us, or green to us, or orange to us, depending upon what that lens is. And we sit there and talk to each other through different lenses and often accuse each other of not seeing things, but the reality is we can't see them or we're not oriented towards seeing them unless we stop and notice that we have this lens on. Now, if somebody stops and says, oh, you have a blue lens on, all of a sudden I look at that white wall color blue in a different way. It still looks blue to me, but my awareness that it's blue is different. So our work in trying to understand this relative to bias is can we understand how our life experiences have filtered the people and the things we're doing in a way that when we see that difference, it actually gives us the opportunity to make that little mental switch to understand what we're putting into the conversation and others aren't. John Searle, a brilliant philosopher from the University of California, <coughs> says background enables linguistic interpretation to take place, enables uh, perceptual interpretation to take place, and it actually structures our consciousness. It actually gives us the world that we see in a profound way. And so we're not talking about something that happens to some people, and we're not talking about something that happens to bad people. We're talking about something that happens to people, that this is the fundamental way the human mind works, and it impacts us and on an everyday basis, because background creates context, and context is everything in terms of how we see the world. And we know context shifts things quite dramatically and in funny ways. For example, if it's in the middle of the winter in Washington, D.C., when I live, where I live, 60 degrees means take off your shirt and lay out and get some sun. If it's the middle of the summer when it's 100 degrees, 60 degrees means let's get a sweatshirt. It's cold. So context is constantly shifting the way we see things. So I'm going to talk about five basic functions and patterns of the mind that impact these things relative to bias. One is selective attention or inattentional blindness, projection, Power and empathy, and some of the, this is something I'm really excited about because some of the newest research we're doing is around power and empathy. Social primacy, and finally, the subliminal, because we know that a lot of stuff is affected subliminally. Over 30 years of studying emotional intelligence, and I'm not talking about studying it at Esalen, I'm talking about some of the major universities in the world, we've learned that virtually all of the things we do, whether making decisions, strategy, behavior, or performance, relationships, all of these things are fundamentally governed by emotion. In fact, what we, that human beings are far less rational than we are rationalizing. In other words, we have an emotional or visceral reaction to something, and we quickly gather the data to support that feeling. So if I meet somebody and I have this moment where I say, you know, there's something about that person I like. Now, even that thought that we have after five seconds of meeting somebody is folly if you give it any thought at all. I mean, how could it possibly be about them? I've only known them for five seconds. So obviously, I'm projecting something onto them. They probably remind me of somebody from my past. But nonetheless, that's our response. And then we act accordingly. And this, this shows up in interviews. So let's say Anna comes in in the morning, and I meet you, and I have that feeling, something about you that I like. So I ask you the first question of the interview, and you hem and haw a little bit. Without even thinking about it, I say, look, I know it's an interview. Take a breath. Let me ask the question again. You get a second chance. Now the interview goes great. I'm making eye contact. I'm laughing at your jokes, You know, whatever. Will comes in in the afternoon. Let's say it's not even one of those times when my sleaze alarm goes off, although that sometimes happens. Not with you, of course, but it sometimes happens. You meet somebody and they turn you off. But let's say it's more that, that you, um, you know, I'm, I'm distracted. I just got off a meeting with a client and, you know, it's still in my mind. So I'm only half with you. And I ask you the first question of the interview. And this time, as you hem and haw, I just sit there. Or even worse, I make one of those quick glances on my watch that you're not supposed to see. Now you're sweating bullets. And based on nothing more than that, the interview goes two completely different directions. Elizabeth asked me the next day, how did it go? And I say, bright, easy to talk to. I think she'd work out fine here. He's OK. I have no idea, no conscious idea that I had anything to do with those interviews. 
Does there anybody here who doesn't know that you do this to people 25 times a day? Or you pass one person in the hallway, you say hello, somebody else you don't. Subtleties, things that are influencing us. You interview one person in the morning when you're fresh at your desk. You interview a second person, even using a structured interviewing process, you interview a second person over lunch, and you interview a third person at the end of the day when you're tired, and you've actually conducted three different interviews, even though the structured questions are the same questions. So we're influenced by things that we don't even realize. Now, we know, and people like Danny Kahneman and other people have taken us way ahead of this. I know that you've studied this work, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. But we know that a lot of this happens in the fast brain, in the limbic system. We see some circumstance or some person. <clears throat> it catalyzes a particular reaction as we filter through the background what we see. The faster the emotional brain takes over, you know, the amygdala sends a signal to the hippocampus and says, what is this? And then to the hypothalamus, the sort of air traffic controller of the brain, which sends the signal to someplace else. And then maybe to the anterior cingulate cortex or the cingulate gyrus and says, get that foot or leg in action. If I were to take this clicker and throw it to somebody, your hand would come up to, 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 to catch it before you even had a thought. And this is all very important. Very fa fast brain is very helpful to us. It's where stereotyping happens. You know, we see that person, we make that assessment. Smile, friendly, fist, dangerous. Knife above the head, watch out. We know somebody comes up with a knife above our head, we don't look up and say, oh, what is that? And what he's I wonder what it is and what he's going to do with it. It's not a very practical way to operate. And similarly, when we see certain behaviors, we associate with that. You know? Now, tremendously helpful, tremendously valuable, and tremendously necessary for our survival. Also tremendously problematic in terms of making assumptions about people at times. And this is the challenge that we have. In those circumstances, do we really know what we're seeing, or are we reacting to what we're seeing? And we know times when the mind and our eyes can even be deceiving. So for example, if you look at this checkerboard, this is um, Ted Adelson, who's at the U uh, MIT. And you look at block A and block B up here, which one is darker? Now, A clearly looks darker. And some of you are saying, what's the trick? But A clearly looks darker. Right? In actuality, they're exactly the same color. Now, the reason it looks darker is because the eyes align around a particular expectation. The cones and rods of the eyes actually align around. And, and we have an expectation. Pattern recognition is one of the most familiar functions of the human mind. And most of us are very familiar with the light, dark, light, dark pattern of a checkerboard. It's actually the same color because the shadowing area created by the pillar darkens B and makes it the same color. This is not a computer trick, by the way. You could test it out yourself. Dr. Adelson has this available online, so you can look at it. So we're, we're making this assumption that they're different when actually they're the same. Now, the fascinating thing about this one to me is even though we now know they're the same, they still look different. Isn't that extraordinary? <laughs> you would think that if a rational mind was actually leading the way, that now that we know they're the same, that we would see them as the same. But it's an indication of how we're rooted into these very kinds of things that, that trigger us in ways that we don't know. And the same thing can happen with people. You know, even though I know that that person, I should treat that person the same as I treat somebody else, my visceral feeling about that person can still in very subtle ways. So I know you've been dealing with micro behaviors, you know, micro advantages, micro inequities that play out through the various ways this happens. Who do I invite to lunch? Who do I pay more attention to? We know, for example, from the research we're doing with power, that people in power situations tend to make less eye contact when they're listening and more eye contact when they're speaking. This shows up a lot in male-female relationships, particularly, that men have a tendency because societally, it's not a personal power, but societally it plays itself out, that men will pay more attention, give more eye contact when we're speaking and less eye contact when we're listening to women. As a, and I'm talking now archetypically, of course, not about every man and every woman. So these are subtleties that can play out in ways. So projection becomes another piece of this. Projection is simply the dynamic that has us look out there in the world and determine what that is based on a prior experience or prior knowledge of what that thing is we're looking at. To some degree, we project in every circumstance with everything we're doing. If I look at that form in front of me, I know it's a man because in my mind I say, oh, that's what men look like. Otherwise, everything that we see would be newly experienced. And we know this occurs in the brain, in the hippocampus. And how it might show up, for example, when diversity is concerned, I'll, I'll use an example. You know, I grew up in the Leave it to Beaver generation. I know a lot of you are probably 
don't know what Leave it to Beaver was, but it was one of those sitcoms of the 60s and 70s. They were all the same. Dad went off to work in the morning with his briefcase and his suit on. Mom stayed home and did all the domestic chores in her pearls and high heels. I, even, I thought that was bizarre even when I was a kid. Nonetheless, the kids would do something mischievous and dad would come home and solve the family's problems. This was the sitcom MO of the 1960s and early 70s. All virtually the same. So if one grew up in that generation, then probably on an unconscious level, you have some association between the role of women and domestic responsibility. Now, you're sitting in a meeting and the vice president of production, Jane Smith, walks in. And without even thinking about it, you turn to Jane and say, Jane, can you go check and see if we have any coffee? Because at that moment, Jane Smith becomes June Cleaver. Now, another dynamic of this, which is really important, is to recognize that Jane may also herself say, let me go see if there's any coffee, because she may also have internalized the responsibility of being Jane, uh, June Cleaver. And this is really important for us to get, that we internalize these same dynamics about ourselves, expectations about ourselves, as other people have about us. We're constantly projecting on each other. It's one of the most foundational pieces of the way we look at each other as human beings. However, when we know that when something triggers us, triggers that limbic fast brain reaction, that part of the brain tends to lose its power. In fact, we can look at, at um, scan, brain scans and see the blood actually flows back to the limbic system and leaves the prefrontal cortex. Uh, Daniel Goleman called this an amygdala hijacking. The amygdala takes over the system. And this is where our kind of fear reactions come from. And amygdala hijacking puts us back into fight, flight, or freeze, sort of more basic instinctive reactions. Freud said that the conscious, or the more thoughtful part of our brain, was the iceberg, and the unconscious, the largest part underneath. But current research shows that the conscious is more like a snowball on the tip of the iceberg. That virtually everything we do is governed by unconscious. In fact, the fast brain probably operates a couple hundred thousand, thousand times more than the slow brain does. So we're constantly making these determinations, which we're then rationalizing. The net of all this is that, as Bucky Fuller said, 99% of who you are is invisible and untouchable. Or as my friend Sukhvinder Obi, who's a brain scientist in Canada, says, our brains seem to have evolved to be good enough most of the time. And this is a bit threatening to smart people. This is why here at Google, you have to be particularly careful about this. Because when we've been rewarded our whole life for being smart, we begin to believe and have confidence that our opinion, what we see, makes more sense than it actually does. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. So this creates diagnosis bias, the tendency to spot things and determine it really quickly. Diagnosis bias, we might say, is the propensity to label people, ideas, or things based on our initial opinions. Diagnosis bias, we might say, is the propensity to label people, ideas, or things based on our initial opinions. So I want you to imagine, for example, that um, you've got a grown son. And your son says, I'm going to bring my, my love interest home, my new love interest home, and, uh, or son or daughter, we'll say. And, uh, and they say, we're going to bring our new love interest home. And uh, these are the two people whose pictures you see about possibly being the love interest. You know, who would you be more inclined to hope it is? Well, this on the left is John Fetterman. He's the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania. That's his zip code on his arm. He's a master's degree in public policy from Harvard, served in AmeriCorps, and has done amazing things about transforming his community financially. He goes around the, world, the country now, apparently training other communities to do this. This is Ted Bundy, the serial killer. <laughs> no. We make these determinations having nothing to do with rationality. This is just who we are and what we do. And this leads to particular um, Reaction, those reactions come from a couple different places. And Amy Cuddy and, and uh, Susan Fisk and Peter Glick um, have identified this in two ways. One is how warmly, how likable that person is, and the other is how competent we hold them. And, and, and this can show up in lots of ways. We can feel very warmly towards somebody and not respect them and their competence. This happens, of course, with sometimes with people who are um, elderly people or people with disabilities, that sort of thing. Um, also, um, <clears throat> with certain other groups where who we, you know, we like them, it's just we don't even realize because we like them so much how much we're diminishing them. This is where sort of patronizing liberalism can come from also. Um, or we see them as competent, we just don't like them so much. This is a lot what LGBT folks face. It's not that people don't think that they're competent, it's just that you know, they may be competent, but I'm just not comfortable with them, somebody might say. So it's important for us to be able to distinguish that because it gives us a better handle on how this might play out in different places.
Another of these phenomena is, is selective attention. Now, selective attention is, is one that we all know. I was, in fact, Sukhvinder and I were talking recently. He said, you know, I noticed when I found out my wife was pregnant, all of a sudden the next day I was out and I began to notice baby strollers in a different way. And I began to go up to people and say, tell me how come that baby stroller has this versus that. He said, my whole life I've never had any interest in baby strollers, but one, one thing happens and boom, all of a sudden I see the world in a different way. We know that we see that. Now, we've had some really fascinating research about this. One of them, we're doing some work with the American Association of Medical Colleges, training people in medical schools to be more sensitive to how unconscious bias plays out and things like health disparities. And uh, this study came from there. This guy, Trafton Drew at Harvard Medical School, sent out to radiologists a lung scan, asked them to check for cancer nodes, which are tiny, tiny microscopic things. But there's something interesting about this lung scan. Do you see it up here? Yeah, this, this grill is a little highlighted, so you can see it a little bit more than it was in the original picture. You want to get really scared? 83% of the radiologists didn't see it. Cancer nodes are about 150 at that size. They were looking for this. They didn't see this. It's remarkable how this happens, and it happens in lots of other ways. Now, one particular case, a legal case that this happened in, Kenneth Conley was a police officer who was convicted in 1997 of perjury because he was chasing a perpetrator of a crime, ran right past somebody who was being beaten up and denied seeing them, and the, the court didn't believe him, basically. He was convicted of the crime. Now, he was eventually exonerated. Well, two researchers, Daniel Simons and Chris Chabris, who some of you are, are familiar with because of their, their gorilla, the invisible gorilla exercise that, that they're very well known for, and they've been really brilliantly out front of this whole inattentional blindness conversation recreated the experiment. They had students run around a campus. Um, this one student was following another student as they were running, and the student in front was told to touch his cap routinely. And, um, and the student behind was told to count the number of times they touched the cap. While this was happening, they actually run past, ran past a simulated fight. And then they checked how, how many people actually saw that fight. They found only one third of people noticed the fight at night, which was the conditions the actual crime occurred. And 40% didn't, only 40% only noticed it in broad daylight. In other words, when we're attentive to one thing, we always miss other things. We can't see everything, so we see the things we're focused on. This is why so often when we're in meetings, one person will see certain something, and somebody else will say, well, I didn't see that. And we have a tendency, because of that good person, bad person paradigm where diversity is concerned, to assume that that means that people didn't care about it, when in fact they just may not have seen it. And we also know we're influenced subliminally. So, you know, for example, University of Leicester researchers recently went into a wine shop, actually a grocery store, the wine department, cleared it out, put only French and German wine on. On alternative days, they played French music, German music, or put a French flag and German flag up. And then they track buying patterns. On days that the French flag was up, 77% bought French wine. On days when German flag was up, 73% bought German wines. Oops. Only 14% said they even heard the music, and only one person in the entire study said that they actually thought it influenced them. Another one from medical schools at University uh, Toronto Medical School. They tracked the results of medical school interviews against the weather reports from the day that people were interviewed put them in parallel, found that the people who were interviewed on rainy days received scores in the interviews roughly equivalent to as if they'd had 10% lower scores in their MCATs. Nobody thinks a medical school interviewer says, it's raining, I'm going to cut 10 points off. But nonetheless, so these things are influencing us all the time. The question is, of course, what's influencing us today? You know, what's impacting us today? And then, as I said before, a lot of the new research we're doing is around power and empathy because we're learning some fascinating things. I'm sure that many of you know about the findings of mirror neurons, that back in the late 90s in Parma, Italy, in a lab, they determined mirror neurons in macaque monkeys. They realized that these monkeys tended to have the same brain experience when they watched a researcher eating peanuts as when they were eating peanuts themselves. Remarkable. Marco Iacoboni at UCLA later identified this in human beings as well. So we have this remarkable capacity to mirror people who are around us and to sense what's going on around us. It creates a phenomenon we call homophily, the tendency to, to love the same, to love people who are like us. But we also know that we have a tendency for in-group, out-group bias. And we've known this for over 100 years. William Graham Sumner, the first director of the Department of Sociology at Yale University, determined this way back in 1906. And we're constantly pulled between this tendency to want to resonate with people 
and this in-group, out-group bias. And it shows up in non-dominant and non-dominant and dominant groups. So people in dominant groups will tend to have less mirroring than people who are in non-dominant groups. Those in power will tend to mirror less than those who are out of power. And that's true both individually, when we're power holders in organizations, that is managers versus non-management, for example, and it's also true when we're in powered groups. So the dominant groups in society, for example, in American society, white, uh, male, Christian, heterosexual, that will have a tendency to mirror less, to sense what's going on with people less. We also know that where empathy is concerned, that what the research shows is, and this is research from China, from the US, from Italy, from all over the world, that shows us that, that we tend to have less empathy as soon as we spot people who are different from us, and the first classification for that is race. That we'll tend to have less empathy. Now, let's put this in the context of traditional Diversity training. A lot of the training that we've done, that we did over the years, and I go back way back to the time, the early diversity training where we used to do it with a two by four, a lot of it was advocacy work. We're letting people to understand what it's like to be a member of this group or that group. Ironically, what the brain science is now teaching us is that may make us less empathetic for the people we're dealing with. It doesn't mean that you can't control people that way. You can get people to be careful about what they say, but to get people fully engaged, it may be actually counterindicated to what we're trying to accomplish. Maybe well-intentioned, counterindicated to what we're trying to accomplish. And Sukhvinder in his is because when we, as soon as I identify you as somebody different from me, I be, my empathy center begins to slow down. I can now be careful around you, be careful not to upset you, but I'm less likely to resonate with you. I'm less likely to actually be fully engaged with you. And so it, it may be good for controlling diversity, but maybe not so good for, for creating inclusion in that regard. It's ironic, you know, because it, it, at, I mean, at some level, it was what we needed to do in the early days because it was like, it's like the sculptor with the big block of stone. You know, you take the big chisel to start to do the work. But from the standpoint of organizations who really want to create full inclusion, and we, we were just talking about this relative, for example, to when you're working, for example, in gender dynamics, if you only work with women in gender dynamics, you likely are not going to get the same kind of inclusion as if you work with men and women around gender dynamics, as an example. Sukhvinder so in his research said, found out that it turned out that when people were in a powerless mindset, their mirroring system was increased, they became more sensitive to external stimulus, whereas people were feeling powerful, the mirror neuron activation was lower. Power, it turns out, decreases empathy. Is there anything we can do about this? And on an individual level, I want to talk about this on an individual level real quickly, and then I also want to talk with you about systemically what are some things that we're learning we can do about this, because we're now working with you know, companies all over the world to try to have them be develop cultures that are more inclusive, understanding these issues. So the first is to understand that the unconscious is remarkably malleable, and we've got this remarkable capacity for neuroplasticity. The notion that you can't teach an old dog new tricks isn't even true for dogs. The first, and by far the most important thing, of these, these six ways that we're finding for individuals to work is to recognize and accept that you have bias. To remove guilt from the equation and start taking responsibility. Now this is hard because a lot of the diversity conversation is lived in guilt. And that's challenging. You know, this notion, if I have bias, oh my God, I'm a bad person. I thought I was a better person, but I'm a bad person. But in actuality, if we can't choose that, if 90 plus percent of the things that happen every day in organizations that differentially impact one person versus another occur more like what I talked about in this interview than they do because somebody's out to get somebody, it's challenging for us to accept that in ourselves and work with it. The metaphor I like to use is it's, it's kind of like the um, clutch in a standard transmission automobile. You know, when the standard transmission automobile, you step on the clutch, the engine doesn't stop running, it just stops motoring the car. So this is where mindfulness work can really come in. Learning self-observation work can really come in to help us. We can begin to notice the bias in ourselves, but by noticing it with, with non-judgmental awareness, we can say, OK, I have that bias. I need to watch how that impacts my interaction with this person. But that, that, that is fundamentally built on the notion that we can create environments in which we can talk about those biases. And we know that we live in a cultural environment where that's not welcomed right now. It's dangerous. It has legal implications particularly. So that's, that can be really problematic. And that's why the second is most important, to develop the capacity to, what we call it, using a flashlight on ourselves. My friend Michael Schieser kind of coined that term, you know, to watch ourselves in action. Are there certain people who trigger us more? Are there certain circumstances in which we feel a little antsy? You know, are there certain um, ways of being that cause us to make quick reactions more easily?
No. And by the way, this, one, this piece is really important, especially for Googlers, because you've got so many smart people here. How much does intelligence, confidence, and success matter to this? Well, actually, what the research now shows is that people who are intelligent, successful, and highly confident are more likely rather than less likely to have blind spots. The more you feel like you've got this handled, the more dangerous it becomes. It requires an enormous sense of humility. And I say this all, all the time to my colleagues in the diversity space, that we have to be careful that we don't come in like our stuff don't smell. You know, like we don't have this issue. Because the even the fact that, like I, the reason I started with the story about myself and the angry Santa Claus was because even though I've been doing this for 30 years, I'm still just as susceptible to bias as anybody else is. Now, hopefully we can get to the place where we can notice it more and embrace it more. But as you take this work out, you're going to have to be careful that all the great work you've done doesn't reaffirm, OK, now that we've got this handled, we don't have to keep looking at it. And this is particularly challenging in environments like yours. It requires us practicing constructive uncertainty. You know, to really take a pause. Rollo May, the great psychologist, said freedom is the capacity to pause between stimulus and response. So we've created this little mnemonic. You know, the P is to, is to, is to pay attention to um, what's actually happening beneath our judgments and assessments. And then the second is to acknowledge your own reactions, interpretations, and judgments. The third is to understand other potential reactions that there might be there. And then to select the one that's the most empowering in the environment and finally to execute that. So I go back to Will and my handshake. You know, he shakes my hand and it's softer. He says, okay, I notice his handshake is softer. I notice that I have a tendency, let's say, to interpret that as weakness. I gotta be careful about that. He could have an injury. At that moment, he's now thinking from here rather than from over there. That's a moment of freedom. That's when we have the moment to make a determination potentially about what's going on with that person. To explore awkwardness and discomfort. Those times when something's off rather than to back away from it and search to comfort. I mean, what's triggering me here? What's making me uncomfortable? The fifth is to engage with people you consider to be others and expose yourself to exemplars. Now, this is really interesting. Uh, Brian Nosick and Calvin Lay at the University of Virginia just last year issued a paper where they studied a whole host of attempts that people had to, to soften the impact of bias and found that this was by far the most, the most valuable one. The things you have on the wall, the images that you see, the various kinds of things that reinforce what's good, what's not good. The this is why things like Black History Month are so valuable still even though it would be a lot more valuable if the 11 months weren't White History Month and if we didn't choose the shortest month of the year to be Black History Month, which has always been kind of interesting. Um, but those kinds of things do reinforce a softening or shifting of those biases. And then finally, giving and getting feedback. And I know that you're working a lot on that in your culture right now, that being able to give feedback. But it's important that that feedback be given in a compassionate way. And that is with an understanding that, that person's behavior may not have been intentional. Because if that feedback, especially where diversity issues are concerned, because if that feedback reinforces the finger pointing aspect of it, then it just drives it back underground again. People begin to go in hiding rather than simply engaging in that behavior. And the last piece, as we look at the group, is, is understanding social primacy. I mean, we're all familiar with Maslow's hierarchy, I'm sure. Abraham Maslow, 70 years ago, said you had to get basic needs met before you get other needs met. He said physiological needs met first, and then safety and onward. Brilliant model, tremendously helpful to science. It appears that he may have been wrong, that in fact, our need for belongingness may be our key human need. And it makes sense if you think about it, a newborn baby can't get their physiological needs met unless they belong to somebody. The first imprint that we have as human beings is, I only exist because he or she exists. And this is core to us, this, this sense. And in fact, what, what science is now showing is that being excluded from group triggers activity in the same regions of the brain associated with physical pain, which is why every time one of these horrible instances happen, whether it's Columbine or Sandy Hook or this, thing, this terrible thing that happened in Southern California a couple months ago, what's the first word you almost always hear to describe the perpetrator? Loner, exactly. It's also probably contributes to the fact that four times as many gay teenagers commit suicide because it gets internalized. And so we have to recognize that how we operate as a group has a huge impact on us. And this is why what you're taking on, training the entire organization, can have a huge impact. We have to change systems so that we're thinking from a systems perspective. Now, um, just to give you an example of that, a lot of you know that in 1975, 5% of the musicians in the major orchestras in the world were women. And by even by after 1980, after 10 years of the women's movement, it was still only 12%. But now it's getting close to 40%. 
And why is that? Because orchestras around the world put in a whole host of activities designed to change the way they did that. They opened up auditions to people. They changed the, the way auditions were calibrated in terms of the numbers of people who were on the, the listening um, team. And they also did something structurally, which is to have musicians begin to audition behind screens and on rugs so that people could only evaluate the music rather than the musician. Well, you can begin to do things like that. On the other hand, we have to be careful to understand, to track things over time. How many people here have heard of the Scared Straight program? Anybody? Scared Straight was initiated in the late 1970s in Rahway, New Jersey, in a prison. They started bringing in young, what they called in those, case, in those days juvenile, defend, juvenile um, delinquents. They now, we now call them youth offenders. Bring them in with tough prisoners, and the tough prisoners would scare the hell out of them and tell them, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, do this to you and that to you if you come into prison. And they'd leave, and you could see them on film, 60 Minutes did a piece on it, and see them and say, I don't want to go to prison, I don't want to come out of prison. You know, so great. Everybody started copying it. Orange is the New Black even had an episode about it. Right? 25 years later, they evaluated these programs. You know what they found? 13% more likely to go to jail. <laughs> now, my hypothesis about this, because I've worked with a lot of young people like that, is that most of them feel powerless. And their bravado is on top of that feeling of powerlessness. You put somebody in, who feels powerless into somebody who's the toughest SOB they've ever seen before, their internal mechanism says, if I act like that, then I'll be safe. So we have to be really careful as we put these things in place. So what we're starting to look at is three basic ways of doing organizational change around this. The first is priming. What kinds of things do you have people look at before they come into a circumstance? So for example, before people look at resumes, to take a few minutes and say, I want you to ask, you know, answer these eight questions. Does this resume remind you of anybody? Is that a positive or a negative? memory? Is there something about this resume that jumps out at you particularly strongly? Is that really relevant to the job? You know, does this person remind you of yourself in any way? Is that relevant to the job? You know, so questions that begin to orient. Now, the, there's two things. First of all, it actually gets you to look at the resume in a particular way. But secondly, by the way, all of this follows some basic education work around this issue. But secondly, and more importantly, it reminds me, wait a second, I've got to pay more attention to the evaluator than I do to the resume. And just that recognition, that awareness is really important. So there are, there are dozens of ways that we can look at priming. And I've started to work with our clients around priming so that they come into these questions in particular, into these various structures in particular ways. The second way is to look at systems and structures. So we just saw a good example of that. When you have people do their audition behind a screen, that's a different system or structure. Where interviewing is concerned, for example, do you use structured interviewing, but also conduct interviews in the same place or at the same time of day? Before you do the interviews, do you give people potentially the questions that they're going to be asked so that people who are introverted versus extroverted or people who come from different cultures or for whom English is their second language aren't at a disadvantage in terms of quickly responding to those questions? You know, so we can look at all kinds of ways to do that. The third is, of course, accountability. Um, and that is, what are we tracking? What are the numbers we're tracking? Kahneman said the odds of limiting the constraints of biases in a group setting rise when discussion of them is widespread. So that you're talking about it a lot actually will encourage people to, to take it more seriously. Now, if that becomes yeah, yeah, yeah in the background, that's the problem. The problem is how do we keep talking about it in new and different ways? How do we keep keeping it fresh for people? Because at some point, it becomes like the wallpaper. You know, at some point it becomes, you know, you look at the mountains out here, these beautiful mountains, and most of you probably don't even notice them anymore if you've been coming here every day because they become like the wallpaper in the background. You know, and even though they were extraordinary and beautiful the first time you saw them, at some point they're just there. So we have to keep this conversation fresh. You see, even if we do all of this, we're in danger. Even if we put all the right systems in place, we can be in danger of not being very effective. I've struggled with my weight my whole life up until the last few years. I've been 30 or 40 pounds heavier than I am now. And if you look at my weight chart for most of my life up until about three years ago when I became vegan, it's been like this. You know. And during all that time when I was heavy, I knew everything there was to know about dieting. I promise you, I read every diet book there was. I tried every fad diet there was. I mean, not like it's that hard anyway. You eat less and you exercise more, right? And I'm sure everybody here has something like that in your life, something you know you should be doing but you don't do. There's something beyond developing strategies, and that is developing new awarenesses for the way we think. This is what you have the capacity to do here in what you're trying to do with your unconscious bias process. And that is to really shift our way of thinking. It's scary to us as human beings. Because if we really understand what this stuff is teaching us, it's that we can't trust the way we think.
And that's a scary feeling for us as human beings. We want to go towards certainty. We want to go to thinking that we know what we're doing. So I'd like to end with this picture. This is a uh, picture of an aspen forest in Colorado. Because for me, it's a perfect metaphor for who we are as human beings. I'm sure many of you have seen these aspen trees. They're remarkable. They're 80 to 100 feet tall, and there are thousands of them. They say ran Rob straight on these beautiful mountainsides. You know? And there's something really remarkable about aspen trees, and that is they're not individual trees at all. The aspen forests are the largest intact organisms of the world. The largest one in northern Utah is 80,000 trees, one plant connected by a common root system. For me, it's a perfect metaphor for who we are as human beings. You know, we look at these identities as if we're different. And we do have different content in our identities. We do have different experiences in our life and different ways our identities shape our world. But at an underneath level, at the root level, we basically relate to the world very similarly. And if we can remember that as we're dealing with each other and bring compassion to each other in that way, our opportunity to really understand how we see the world becomes very real for us. And the ability to work together, create organizations where everybody can be effective becomes possible.